Hi guys, hope you had a good weekend and a good uh, Easter holiday. Uh, last week we were talking about the Great Depression and the United States trying to work its way through that Great Depression with the New Deal under uh, Franklin Roosevelt. Uh, and so those were considered the interwar years. Now we're ready to move forward to the Second World War. Uh, and we're going to start off our conversation with the rise of totalitarianism. Uh, but before we get to that, guys, I just want to review a little bit. Last year, we talked about the Treaty of Versailles, the peace treaty that ended World War I, uh, how raw of a deal Germany got. And so I just want to emphasize that, remember, that really brought about a lot of angst in Germany, especially, and that that really was a driving force for uh, the German people to say, okay, Adolf Hitler, we'll follow you. You're going to right the wrongs that have uh, happened to us. And so I, I just want you guys to keep that in mind as we kind of work through this idea of the rise of totalitarianism. All right, so guys, first of all, totalitarianism, the definition for this is a system of government that is centralized and a dictatorial um, system as well, which requires complete subservience to the state. All right, and so what all that fancy mumbo jumbo basically means is uh, it's a centralized government, which means power rests in one part uh, of the government uh, in the capital, and it's usually under one person or one small group of people. So remember, guys, that's called an oligarchy where you have a small dictatorship, but usually it's just one dictator. Okay, um, and the thinking behind it is that this dictator, they wield basically all the power. The citizens have almost no rights because they are subservient to the state. The idea that uh, you're putting the state or the your country's interest ahead of your own at all times. Okay, uh, so we really saw several prominent countries between World War One and World War Two. Uh, move towards a totalitarianism uh, type of system, a totalitarian government of some sort. Okay, and several times we see this because of economic problems. Um, so the Great Depression that we experienced, guys, uh, you already at that time were starting to have more of a global economy. Uh, and also there's the factor of the loans and all those situations where uh, basically... Uh, the United States, you know, we uh, were giving money uh, to Germany to help them pay off, you know, the Treaty of Versailles, uh, the war debts uh, that the Allies were forcing them to pay. Uh, and then also, so the, those war reparations, uh, and then what happened, guys, is the Europeans, the, the French and, and the British, they owed us loans from World War One, so they owed us money, so they were turning around and giving us our own money. Well, when we have no more money to give to Germany, all the legs fall out on that system, basically, right? So we don't have any money to give to Germany, therefore Germany can't afford to keep paying war reparations, therefore that money that they were getting from war reparations to pay the United States, we're not getting it, it's just a vicious cycle. Uh, and so the Great Depression in the United States really had a big impact almost worldwide, basically. Okay, um, so we have to keep that in mind. So some of that stems from that people's reaction to um, the bad economy, uh, which part of that was then you have a rise in uh, numbers for communist parties and, and the like where people are getting desperate and they're wanting a radical change because they're saying, well, this just isn't working for us. Um, so some of that was to offset those radical parties. Um, and then sometimes, guys, it was uh, other factors, uh, just purely uh, social factors or, or the likewise. Um, so you have really a rise in this in Germany, Italy, Japan, Spain, uh, and the Soviet Union guys, which remember uh, was Russia now going by Soviet Union during this time period, uh, now that they've experienced a communist revolution uh, under Lenin. So we're going to start with Italy and talk about their situation, guys. Um, so 1919, Benito Mussolini, 
Uh, he created the fascist party in Italy. And so fascism, guys, very similar to totalitarianism, um, just with more of a nationalistic flavor. Um, so you notice here, nation is more important than the individual and their rights, very clearly uh, kind of a totalitarian style. Uh, like I said, just kind of more emphasis on nationalism. Okay, uh, and so he is going to enlist the help of his supporters, the black shirts, they're basically thugs who intimidated the opposing parties, intimidated communists, intimidated people that were more conservative and did not want to move towards a fascist uh, type of nation. You know, he really claimed he was fighting communism um, and that he was going to be saving, he was going to be the savior of Italy, save them from communism, uh, recreate the glory of the Roman Empire, uh, bring back that prestige, uh, as well as restore order, okay, uh, that had befallen Italy, following World War I and all its problems. Um, and one of his big kind of slogans was that he was going to make the trains run on time, uh, which, if you think about it, guys, makes sense of kind of a sign of order back then because uh, the train's getting off schedule, that's a big deal. People are thinking, hey, my train's going to leave here, it's going to get here at this time. If they don't leave in time, they don't get to their destination in time, people are late, people are waiting. Um, and so it can be kind of chaotic once they get off a of schedule. And so his big deal was, hey, I'm going to make the trains run on time. I'm going to bring order to Italy, and people ate that up for the most part. Even many conservatives, uh, you know, the Roman Catholic Church, were like, yep, okay, sign us up uh, because of that fear of communism, because of uh, him claiming to bring order to Italy. Uh, the USSR and Joseph Stalin, guys. So uh, the USSR, like I said, was established under uh, V.I. Lenin, Vladimir Ilyich Lenin. Uh, so he led the revolution during World War I to uh, depose the Russian Empire, depose the Tsars. Um, and was successful in that. There, after the war, guys, there was uh, they made a peace settlement to get out of it, and then there was an internal struggle between White Russia, so non-communist basically, and Red Russia, the communists in Russia. Uh, and so there, there was a war that kind of waged for several years. Stalin was a big supporter of Lenin and and the Reds. Um, so was Leon Trotsky. And so when Stalin, guys, they obviously the, the Soviets, the Russian communists, um, the Bolsheviks is what they're called, uh, that when they won out and uh, Lenin passed away, Stalin and Leon Trotsky, uh, kind of his number two guys, Lenin's number two guys, they were vying for power. Uh, and finally, in 1926, Stalin's going to outmaneuver Leon Trotsky. He's going to um, originally basically kick him out of the country. Uh, many historians believe, you know, Trotsky, he was assassinated in Mexico. Many uh, historians believe that Stalin was just couldn't get over his rival, and so he actually um, made sure that he couldn't come back and, and be a challenger to his power, and so he had him assassinated, is what a lot of people believe. Um, so he becomes dictator of the USSR, of the Soviet Union. 1928, he starts his first round of five-year plans um, and these plans guys are supposed to help Russia's economy um, kick start it you know you did see an uptick in steel production and things like that but they also made collectives so they took private property private farms made them these collectives um, that people are growing food on and this just did not work at all it was terrible for the peasants you had about 10 million people die uh, during this five-year plan of mostly starvation. So terrible, terrible situation, but, you know, this totalitarian government, you know, Stalin's firmly in the saddle. He's the dictator. He's the boss, and this is what he wants to happen, and he doesn't care what happens to people. Um, you know, their lives aren't worth making the Soviet Union powerful. Okay, so also very uh, paranoid type of person, very brutal uh, sent millions of people to the gulag is what it's called um, so this kind of prison camp work camp in Siberia so very very cold conditions terrible conditions to be in 
Uh, and so, yeah, guys, you know, he, when you talk about monster category, you know, these monsters in history, um, he's right up there. You know, one of the biggest differences between him and the guy we're about to talk about, Adolf Hitler, is he was on our side. But that was probably the biggest difference. That and the kind of systematic way in which uh, Hitler killed people. And that's a little different with Stalin. Okay, Germany and Adolf Hitler, like I mentioned, he's our next subject. Um, so, the fascist group, the Nazis, which means National Socialists. Um, that's what they stand for. And once again, guys, the communists, right? We talked about this last year. The communists, the fear of communism, um, you know, that was a big driving factor for people to support the Nazis of, hey, this group's going to stand up to the communists and make sure they don't take root in our country. Um, blame the Treaty of Versailles. Blame the Jews for Germany's problems. We talked about economic issues in Germany, you know, the lack of value in their currency, the Deutschmark. Um, you know, the women bringing wheelbarrowfuls of uh, money to buy a loaf of bread. Bad, bad deal, right? So Hitler comes in and says, hey, I'm going to fix all this. You know, 1923, even before people really knew who the Nazis were, he tried to uh, hold a revolution, uh, stage a revolution, guys, in a beer hall in Munich uh, called the Beer Hall Punch. Um, so this was unsuccessful. He's arrested, writes Mein Kampf, right? Mein, my struggle is what that means in German, uh, where he lays out, hey, it's the Allies' fault. This is the Allies' fault. This is Jews' fault. You know, a lot of anger and hate. Uh, and this guy emerges from prison and says, you know what? How I do this is not a, you know, bloody revolution. It's take control of the government through votes. And by 1932, guys, not the Nazis have the majority in the Reichstag, which is their like their legislature, like our Congress. Um, so part of this guy's part of their success was blame the Jews and blaming uh, the British and the French and the treaty and all that and the former government for the treaty. Uh, but another part of it was intimidation. So he used stormtroopers. He learned, you know, his he modeled a lot of what he did after Mussolini. Mussolini was kind of his hero. Uh, you know, they're both fascists. Uh, and so he, like Mussolini, used the, the black shirts. He used the stormtroopers, which some people call the brown shirts, um, to intimidate voters and intimidate people away from the Communist Party, away from the Conservative Party, uh, the Liberal Party, all that. So um, they take power in 1933. They basically force Hitler into the government as chancellor. Soon after that, he's going to gain dictatorial powers. We talked about, once again, because of the fear of communism, that there's a communist plot to kill all these Germans and destroy the government, bring the government down. And so people hand it over, okay, you know, you take all that dictator, dictatorship power, dictatorial power, uh, because we want to be safe from the communists. Japan, guys, you had militarists take over in Japan in the late 1920s. Um, so they kind of believed it was Japan's destiny to rule the earth. Uh, therefore, obviously, you know, hey, we're going to invade a lot of places. They wanted to expand into East Asia. Uh, so you see this played out in 1931 with the invasion of Manchuria, uh, which is kind of a territory of China uh, in northeast China. Uh, there was kind of being under dispute for a long time between China and Russia. 1937, guys, they're going to invade China proper. Um, so besides just the territory of China, uh, the actual, you know, what was considered China at that time. Uh, and this is when you have the rape of Nanking, guys, a terrible, terrible event. Um, millions of innocent, innocent Chinese people killed. Um, so big, big problem. And then you have the Spanish. So 1936, civil war breaks out between Spain and fascist forces under Francisco Franco, um, and so Mussolini and Hitler, they help him out, assist Franco, he wins, and this is going to set the stage for World War II, where all these fascist groups are in power and they're ready to roll and, and invade and conquer. 